Good evening, and welcome to our inaugural Literary Legends event. I'm Lynette Marshall, and I serve as president of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement, and we are delighted this evening to have Marilyn Robinson here with us, the Pulitzer Prize winning author and Professor Emerita of the University of Iowa acclaimed Writers Workshop. Welcome, Marilyn. Thank you for being with us. It's wonderful to be here. <clears throat> So Marilyn has just released Jack, her fourth novel in the Gilead series, and it's already number 10 on the New York Times bestseller list. We're so glad you're here this evening and to talk with us and provide some insight on this novel and their beloved characters within it. Marilyn has garnered some of literature's most prestigious awards with this series including the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for Gilead, the Orange Prize, which is now known as the Women's Prize for Fiction for Home, and a National Book Critics Circle Award for Lila. In 2012, President Barack Obama awarded Marilyn the National Humanities Medal, and in 2017, she received an Honorary Doctor of Humane's Letter Award from the University of Iowa. We're truly fortunate to have Marilyn here with us this evening, and we are so pleased to have all of you with us as well. If you have a question throughout the program, please use the chat function, and we will do our best to get to it. Though this novel is set in the uh, pre-civil rights St. Louis, when Jim Crow laws were still entrenched throughout the Southern United States, the racial dynamics of your work are still resonating today. What do you think that Jack and Della are teaching us about bridging those divides and healing our world? Uh, one thing I should say is that Jim Crow laws were all over the country. You can't, you know, they're not regional. They they reached everywhere. Um, even where they were not law, they were custom, you know. Um, in any case, um, I think that, you know, Della especially wants to simply, you know, in a way make the experiment or make it take the risk of uh, living the way her feelings would lead her to live she uh she wants she loves jack there's something about him that uh makes her loyal to him and um she as a matter of sort of personal honor or a sense of her own freedom which is a, a tenuous thing and a hard problem for her to deal with uh she wants to be be loyal to her faithfulness as it were you know um and that's I think that we all have to see beyond the constraints of society, which, as we know, do a world of harm, and um, and respond as we respond to to the fact that people are beautiful and interesting and themselves, you know? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to talk a little bit about the city of St. Louis. As many in your audience know this evening, it's considered to be a gateway city between East and West, as well as between North and South. What is it that drew you to St. Louis for both Lila and for Jack? Um, it might have been entirely accidental in the first place. You know, I, I wanted to feel that, uh, that they were both people who had known a world that's very much not Gilead, you know? Um, I Then I went and looked at St. Louis because I had already committed myself to the fact that that's where Jack would be. Um, and I was, you know, I saw some amazing things, including that uh, that very remarkable cemetery and that very beautiful bridge, you know? Um, so... Well, and you create these remarkably atmospheric novels without necessarily being scenic in them. And um, the landmarks that you mentioned, the Eads Bridge features prominently in Jack, as well as Sumner High School, uh, and then that stunning Bellefontaine Cemetery. When you're researching a novel and citing it, how is it that you maintain that sense of place as you write 
with it as your setting? Well, to the extent that I can make myself familiar with it, I do. Um, at the same time that I'm not very literalistic about, I mean, I choose a few of the, what seem to me to be the most telling sorts of, of, of aspects of the place. Um, I, you know, there, a lot of fiction writing is a sort of self-induced dream where things cohere and things reflect on each other. Um, and you hope that all this happens, you know, in a way that's basically faithful to to the names you use, the places that are actually on the map, you know? Well, it's a beautiful setting uh, and you use it uh, in a lovely way. Thank you. So for those of us who live in Iowa, uh, we were deeply touched by the dedication of your novel, Lila, um, when you dedicated it to Iowa. And I've also been moved as a Midwesterner and uh, a person from a rural community by your descriptions of life in small town Iowa and about our beloved landscape. What is it about Iowa's history and the people and the landscape that make the world of Gilead possible? It's, you know, I, I, it, it's almost an accident that I came to Iowa, or I can say it's destiny that I came to Iowa. But uh, in fact, you know, my whole career virtually after housekeeping is unimaginable if I had not come to Iowa. Mm -hmm. I came here uh, from New England. I wanted to know how to see the landscape because it was a one that I had not been taught to appreciate, really. Um, I wanted to know what the history of the place was, what, why there are so many little colleges. Well, that was of particular interest to me. Um, and then I found out that Iowa was very, very important in the Civil War and in the period that led up to it. Um, and, you know, a, a very heroic, beautiful history that seemed to me to have been forgotten. I, I would say without hesitation that it has been forgotten. Um, and um, it it was so enlightened from the beginning that Jack could actually have thought he could bring his his family to Gilead and they could live there in safety and and you know respect. Um, but then when he actually when he's actually there, he's not sure that that's true. And uh, mm -hmm. and frankly, I think that that's uh, historically faithful to the fact that that Iowa, which has such a marvelous history, has been kind of papered over a little bit by histories that are not its own. Um, you know, uh, there are there were things that were very, very striking about Iowa at an early period, like the very high quality and great distribution of education. Mm -hmm. And um, th that's the kind of faithfulness to a place that would be so valuable if it were retained and if the people were aware of it, you know. Mm -hmm. When Jack does return to Gilead after being in St. Louis for 20 years, he's returned on on a kind of reconnaissance mission, if you will, to see if he and Della, who's his black wife and their son, could live there um, and away from the laws that criminalize interracial marriage. And Jack clearly had high hopes for this, but maybe not the full confidence in his own family or in his neighbors and the people of Gilead. And one of the passages that you write about, uh, Jack says, that's a little like Iowa, no mountains, of course. He'd often thought of walking with her among those fields, undulant as dunes and the vast reaching oaks and the flickering cottonwoods shadowing the rivers a modest, open and sunny place at peace with itself. So many bird songs and such a thrum of crickets. It could be that no one would put those hard questions, that no great eye of custom and expectation would find the two of them on some nameless road through endless country and ask, even silently, why are they here? Should they be walking along together, arm in arm? He couldn't tell her the dreams he had of Iowa, that shining star. 
So then we have to ask ourselves, why not? Why couldn't Jack and Della ultimately move back to Gilead? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think that he, he, you know, he doesn't make the test. You know, I mean, I, I, I believe the loving couple who, test, who tested this in the Supreme Court spent time in Iowa. Perhaps we're married here. I, I might be wrong about that. But the, the relative liberalism of the state abides in many ways in its history and fails in many ways in its history. Mm -hmm. And he, looking at Gilead, has no idea which will happen. He's already come from, I haven't written it yet, but a stinging experience in St. Louis, you know, that he would not want to put his family through again. And one wouldn't want to have to do that. Right. Thank you. We look forward to reading about that experience as well one day, I hope. So I would, be, I would be grateful if you could, um, for us now, reflect a bit on your time at the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. We have many people from across the country with us this evening, including former faculty and administrators and current students and some of the students that you taught who are now teaching in the Writers' Workshop. So what, in your estimation, allows the Iowa Writers' Workshop to continue to shape and even change the arc of American letters. How is the workshop distinct and special? It, um, for such a long time, the, the workshop has been famous and distinguished, you know, and associated with the highest productions of American literature. I um, came here because it's so much a part of American literature, how could I not, you know, when I was invited. Um, there's, a, you, there's a tendency, I think, of success to create success, that uh, the people that teach in the workshop are respectful of the heritage that they have become responsible for. Um, and then, of course, we have, uh, you know, any, any writer, any young writer who applies anywhere is likely to, to apply to us. So we have an enormous pool of of people to choose from. Um, and then there is, uh, there's a, a kind of an atmosphere. There's the, the, you would call the workshop, I think, very democratic in the sense that mm -hmm. the only real credential that matters to us is how well people use language and whether they have something on their minds, you know? So, uh, so we gather all kinds of students and, and uh, then, you know, on the basis of that kind of gift they flourish together. I don't think you would say they compete with each other. Very little competition is actually. But um, the, there are all sorts of things that operate simultaneously. You know, um, the distinction of the place is something that has uh, influenced all these things. And then, then the university itself. I think that, um, again, so, something as democratic as a great public university uh, nurtures the same sort of ethos. Um, if you look, I think you will find that all the great writing programs in the country are in big public universities. And I think that it's partly because American literature recruits its writers out of the whole population, you know, on, on the basis of what they have to say, what they need to tell us and so on. Um, and that I think is something that is, uh, perhaps more in the atmosphere of a big public university than it would be in another kind of school. That's very interesting. I, I like that. Um, how did being at the University of Iowa and teaching within the workshop influence your own writing? Well, you know, I mean, it's a great privilege to sit around and listen to people who are very sensitive to these questions, and very, you know, alert to them. Uh, talk about dialogue and scene and all the rest of it. I mean, even though by the time that I was teaching here, I had already written a, you know, successful novel and so on. But you need, it's like tuning the instrument, you know, it's, it's very nice just to hear people talk about these things and make distinctions among, you know, the different forms that things take and so on. Um, and then, then the, the workshop is really, um, 
set up in a way that encourages people to pursue their interests in, you know, in seminars and so on, and uh, to uh, have time and encouragement. It's very friendly to writers. Can you describe what a seminar class would be like for those of us who haven't participated in that? Well, another lovely thing about the workshop is that we are very autonomous creatures. You know, we teach as we feel it is necessary and good. You know, I teach kind of eccentric seminars, I think, because they tend to be, uh, they're closer to English seminars than they are, I think, to standard workshop seminars. I, I talk about historical literatures rather than craft and, and things like that, which, you know, has an obvious, um, an obvious, form for seminars to take in that setting. Um, but I like to teach, you know, the old grand literature, Moby Dick, you know, the Old Testament and so on. I think it's good for writers to feel that they have some command of the sort of uh, towering heights of, you know, world literature. Um, and, th and that's what I like to teach. I w it was very self-indulgent on my part, really. But uh, people, you know, we don't enforce, for example, grading. Uh, I never graded anything, you know. I, you you write comments on on their prose, and and as far as the seminars go, you just try to give them nutritive things to think about and look at. Uh, and and what they the only value of the seminar is what they as individuals take away from it. You know, there is no grounds for me to appraise what they have chosen as significant out of whatever we look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When you retired from the University of Iowa, President Barack Obama recorded a message that was played uh, at the university-wide event honoring your career at Iowa. And I wanted to have our audience hear just a little bit of what he had to say. Marilyn, over the past few years, it has been a delight to build our friendship. So this is what I saw in your writing. The unspoken values that I believe power our communities and our families and our democracy. The notions that we might not come from the same place or travel the same roads, but ultimately we're all connected, that we can speak to each other across the void. The notion that all of us wrestle with the same kinds of questions, whether we're raising our kids well enough are we living up to our best selves? That's what I think all your novels uncover, the dignity of the struggle to overcome our faults and the beauty of our lives. It's not something that folks always talk about because you know, we might not want to or sometimes because we might not quite know how to. But as John Ames puts it, it all means more than I can tell you. So you must not judge what I know by what I find words for. That is what makes you so special. You uncover what is most meaningful, and when the rest of us can't find the words, you do, which is an incredible gift and a great blessing. So thank you so much for sharing it with me and with people all across this country. Best of luck on the road ahead. We will be in touch as we together are gonna be writing the next chapters in our lives. Bye-bye. That was really wonderful. Like, yes, yes. What a gift. I really like what he had to say when he said um, that the dignity of the struggle to overcome our faults and the beauty of our lives is what your novels help us uncover. And I think you've especially succeeded in doing that in Jack. So the president's words ring true for many of us. What was it like to have a friendship spontaneously grow and develop with a president of the United States? Tell us a little bit of that story, how you became acquainted. Well, um, I heard that he liked my novel. I was very pleased by that. You know, I mean, how, how these things reach, I don't know. But um, and then I, um, I got a... An, an email and it said ask from POTUS that was the subject line and I thought of course it was just you know somebody wanting me to contribute or something um, 
but then I thought about it, and so I I sent uh, the email to to my assistant, and um, she and her partner found that it was indeed from the White House, and but it said you know call and you know you're invited to a dinner, so I called and they said well the dinner is full, and then uh, they called back in just a few minutes and said he wanted me to come, which was very pleasing to me. So I went to a dinner at the White House, a small, a very private sort of dinner. And um, we talked and, you know, and he told me he would like me to correspond with him. And I said, I would love that. And so, and he said, I want physical letters. You know, I want paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that, so that's what we did. We have exchanged a, a considerable number of letters. We've been out of touch for a while, I suppose, both of us working on books, but um, it has been a very wonderful experience. I'm guessing that perhaps you've already sent him a copy of Jack. <laughs> I think my publisher did that. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn, you received a lovely award, um, the Dayton Peace Prize. And in your acceptance speech for that, you said, where men and women have failed to love, literature may inspire greater love for those we had once thought we feared or hated. It's been interesting to see Jack from the perspective of many different characters with differing biases and over the course of your Gilead books. I do think that you have achieved this ideal that you articulated in Dayton with the publishing of this novel. Can you talk to us about the origins of Jack as a character? Um, it's, it's very hard for me to talk about how my novels occur. You know, I, he was always, um, he's a shadowy figure, even, you know, from my point of view, he's also uh, an elusive figure in many ways. Um, but, um, you know, there's a poem that I learned from Edgar Allan Poe when I was a child called Alone. And it goes, when I, uh, from childhood's hour, I have not seen as others saw. I uh, could not bring my passions from the common spring from the same sources. So this this uh, statement, the pose of, of simply being different, someone who does not take his uh, passions from the common spring, you know. And um, I, I, that kind of person, maybe because I'm partly that myself, or holy, um, is very interesting to me. And someone who has his own model of reality, in effect, somebody who has sensitivities to things that other people might not uh, the, either feel or feel in the same way, you know. Um, I, I like the idea of, a, of a really a profound uniqueness in a human person. And I think that for the most part, people are very good at concealing uniqueness, you know, and accommodating themselves to social expectation. And I think some people can't do that or, or simply somehow don't do it. Um, and they live more on the surface of their skin in a way, you know, uh, less self-protective in a or or less capable of self protection and and um i think that if you could have that kind of if you could have the kind of insight that a person like that gives you into him it would be very uh it would be impossible to ignore him or not love him in effect you know i mean how his family certainly do love him and so on but the um he, you know, I more than with any other novel, I've gotten negative reactions to my main character because there are people who notice that he does not contribute to the gross national product. You know, and uh, this is this is a very serious criticism from the point of view of, of of quite a number of people, not really a small number of people. Uh, but that's um, I don't. My definition, my understanding of humanity, does not begin at that point. I. I want the thing itself. 
does does Jack challenge us to um, think about the possibility of grace and how love helps us transcend some of those issues? Well, I, I do think that there's a very, very strong, uh, what should I say, similitude or, or oneness between the concepts of grace and love and also loyalty. Um, the, you know, grace is the ability to step out of a situation and say, perhaps you have wronged me, but I will not wrong you. Perhaps you are in debt to me, but I will not ask for the for the payment, you know. But you, when you break those rules of what would be the spontaneous reaction, um, then you're acting freely and you're acting graciously. And I think that something that's a small human model of the theological conception of grace. Um, I, th I think that in a way taking him out of the network of, you know, human interchanges and understandings, um, it puts him on a different terrain, you know, where, uh, you know, things like competitiveness and retaliation and vengeance and, you know, all that sort of thing, they, they're just not words that would mean anything to him, you know. So you could say, as odd as his life is, it has something in common with the state of grace, I would say. Mm, mm, yes. When your characters pose some of these difficult questions, do they help you work out your own thoughts on these issues? Or are you expressing um, the ideas that you've previously had through the characters? I'm, I'll, I do most of my thinking while I'm writing fiction or writing nonfiction, but um, I don't, I'm very, I, I don't think it serves fiction well to have pre-existing conceptions that you work out, you know, making a sort of a martinet of your characters and so on. Um, I do explore ideas as I write. That's, that's where they are, where they come from. So what compelled you to give Jack his own novel? He was on my mind. You know, sometimes you know a character well enough just because he's been, you know, in your peripheral vision for a couple of years, you know, or something like that. You know him well enough. And for some reason, I, you know, I don't know why people write novels, but for some reason, knowing someone in a certain way implies to me a novel and something to something to explore. Mm, interesting. So it's interesting to me that Jack is the son and godson of two preachers, and he is so deeply influenced by these men who have been part of his life. And yet Jack is an atheist who lives within the world of church doctrine that he's heard his father and godfather argue about, including predestination. Jack seems to be asking from time to time um, the question if he is condemned to damnation, the way his black wife, Della, is condemned by the color of her skin. Does that question continue to be timeless for us? Um. <laughs> I, I, I don't think he's an atheist. I don't, you know, I mean, he, he, he uh, uses, he thinks in scriptural terms. Um, his invocations of Jesus are usually more prayerful than they are merely exclamatory. Um, he, I think that his feeling of being isolated from his family in, in inexplicable ways is something that he, uh, interprets as perhaps atheism, but, or as reprobation, but there is no reason to think um, that this is actually the case. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think people make tentative judgments about things like what they actually most deeply feel. They sort of uh, package them in, in concepts that they can deal in and live with like, oh, I'm an agnostic or I'm an atheist or something. But almost always they have deep questions and, and deep 
you know, attachments to certain concepts and language and so on. So I hesitate to take him seriously when he calls himself an atheist. <laughs> okay. I won't either then. <laughs> <laughs> One of one of your reviewers has suggested that Jack is the prodigal son who hopes to rise again like Lazarus. And while Jack has returned to Gilead, do you think that he will rise like Lazarus? Um, well, you know, <laughs> I haven't written that book. I would be surprised if he did, but you never know what a character is going to do if you give him a fictional world to behave in. <laughs> um, I don't, a lot of people um, tend to take um, the use of scriptural language and so on as a, an invitation to make sort of conventionalized religious interpretations. Um, and I don't, uh, I, you know, I don't encourage that to the extent that I can discourage it. Um, I, we, we've gotten into um, habits of religious thought that are really cliches, uh, that don't do any kind of justice to the complexity of the tradition. Um, and that is something that people simply fall back on, the, what seems to be the relevant model out of whatever famous parable. It's my understanding that you don't um, pay much attention to the reviews of your work, but I was especially touched by Sam Sachs' review in the Wall Street Journal, calling your fiction transcendent in its compassion and generous subjectivities. Hers is a world where confusion, suffering, and wrongdoing are real, but judgment is infinitely withheld. How do you go about presenting these complex and flawed characters without judgment? Well, you know, I, I really never write a character that I can't love, you know? And I, I, my deepest feeling is that all sorts of, of judgments that one might make about a person in the abstract really melt away if they are judgments that could be applied to someone you love. And that I don't think that means that you are misled by love. I think it means that you see truly when you see lovingly, you know. I would, if I, if I didn't let that sunlight fall on every character I wrote, I would make my, I would feel uh, dishonest, manipulative. That's lovely. I would um, remind our listeners that you are welcome to put questions in the chat function. And I just want to offer from one of our guests who's listening in tonight, Marilyn, that she says she was privileged to have studied with you at the workshop. She says she would have let us do the bulk of the talking before entering the conversation. And yes, providing excellent literary nutrition. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I'm yes. so proud of my students. I'm prouder than I have any right to be. I'm very proud of them. <laughs> well, I, I think clearly they're appreciative of the, of the guidance that you've given. I know that many of them have gone on to be remarkable teachers and authors and people who have contributed greatly to, to our world. Um, another one of our guests says, I grew up along the banks of the Nishnabotna near Tabor. I've enjoyed listening to you share your thoughts on science and religion at the First Congregational Church in Iowa City and at other UCC settings. Thank you. Thank so you. lots of lots of nice comments among our many, many listeners this evening. We are grateful to be able to have this time with you tonight. Are there any reflections that you would like to make? I know that you recently had a um, editorial in the New York Times as we come up with fewer than three weeks away now from the presidential election. And your editorial was entitled, Don't Give Up on America. Is there something that you can share with us about the thoughts that you shared in that piece recently in the New York Times? 
I think that um, for some reason, this, people in this country have uh, trouble investing as much value in who they are and what they create as, uh, as it needs, actually, because, you know, as with the great institutions like the universities, uh, who knew that they would be so vulnerable? Who knew that things could happen that actually make the a real question of the form in which they will survive and so on, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm speaking here of the pandemic, of course, but and the consequences for society as a whole, amazing to see. Um, but that you have to, uh, people don't realize that the American public education system is a, one of the wonders of the world. There are hundreds of major universities in this country, which is just astonishing. And uh, there are people undervalue institutions like that, and, and people eat away at them with all this talk about, you know, saving taxpayers money or something, never mentioning the fact that they're depleting the, well, the richness of their own children's education while they do it. Um, there, I mean, I'm, I, my focus, of course, because of my career is on, on universities and libraries and so on. But uh, I think we, you know, we don't treasure them appropriately. And where we will have to make difficult choices, we have to choose to be loyal to uh, what used to be called our civil institutions, the sort of, of autonomous, self-perpetuating, humane uh, institutions like the Writers' Workshop, for example. I have, um, thank you. I have another couple of questions that some of our listeners are asking. Uh, a woman writes, wonder is a clear value across your writing, not just your fiction. Sylvie, Lila, Ruth, all characters who feel the pull of wandering. Could you talk about how those things connect for you? The, the, the initial word you say is wonder or wander? Wander, W-A-N-D-E-R. <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, it's part of my tendency to pare people down to something essential in them so that they're not even really geographically uh, characterized or identified. Um, I like, I don't know, I, it might just be, you know, that I grew up in the West. I'm used to the to the romance, you know, of the idea that you can go forever and see a new world and all the rest of it that just comes from from the fact of having a huge terrain available to you. This is, of course, in a in a future that I would certainly like to see return. But um, it's uh, to me, I I think you know it's. What can I say? It's a situation in which people uh, take on um, a kind of self that is not bleeding away into institutions or so on that, that would seem to, to govern them or to con create them even. Another question for you from a listener. How are fiction and Christianity alike and different? Oh my goodness, that's a book. <laughs> a good book. I would read that book. Um, well, you know, um, Christianity is a narrative. Uh, you know, and I mean, the, the Gospels are brief, but they are only about basically one narrative turned over and turned over, you know, so that it's, it's a very substantive you know, within within the literary limits of of the four gospels, um, it's uh, you know where we are invited to watch what must have seemed an ordinary man surrounded by a society to whom he is incomprehensible for the most part, who nevertheless reacts uh, with gentleness and healing and and harmlessness who, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing about the incarnation and the life of Christ as a man 
is that it is in itself novelistic. It, we are watching a, a human being in the sort of dustier regions of the earth. And um, I think that novels, which really became sort of a, an important form in the 18th and 19th century, do basically the same thing. They, they watch a human being, they try to comprehend, they try to understand the moral meaning of actions and omissions, you know. Always with a, some borrowed implication that he, it, the character is profoundly important, that the word sacred can be perhaps applied. Mm -hmm. You use the word harmless, which takes me back to Jack and his desire to <laughs> do no harm. Yes. Well, you know, he does, he does allude to the servant songs in Isaiah, you know, not, not breaking the bent reed and not snuffing the smoldering flint fire and so on. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if given his mind, given his acculturation, he, I think, would inevitably think of harmlessness in those terms. I think so. Marilyn, you have been in New York for several months during the pandemic yeah. in your home there. And we know that writing a book includes sharing it with many others. And I'm guessing that normally you would have been traveling for several weeks now to talk with people about your book. What does it look like to publish a, a book in this moment and be able to share with the world uh, what it's about and to do a book tour without leaving home, perhaps? It has its advantages. It certainly does. Um, <laughs> no question. I, I uh, miss audiences. And I think people feel freer to ask questions and so on if we're actually human beings in a space together, you know. Um, but on the other hand, one thing that I have found out is that in these kinds of conversations, sometimes there are people from all over the world Mm -hmm. who have joined the conversation, you know. And and that simply could not be accomplished in any other way. I, I, I think that's pretty wonderful, you know. Um, I, uh, I'm getting used to it. I have a tendency to, you know, kind of sink down to, into the lower parts of the screen and so on. But, you know, basically it's fine. Good, good. Well, I'm delighted that you're able to, to do that with us this evening. So you said that you um, had been thinking a lot about Jack, which was why he got his own novel. Is there another character that you've been thinking a lot about that we might look forward to? You know, I can't, I don't know at this point, I mean, my mind, you know, I have lived with, with this world and this characters for many years now. And I think it's almost a habit of mind that I drift back into, you know, considering what I have looked at before. Um, and so at this point, I cannot say, yes, there will be another novel. And I cannot say, no, there will not be one. Well, I would vote for another one. <laughs> okay. and, and I will bear that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. <laughs> I'm going to just check and see if we have other questions from our other guests. I, I think we've gone through most of those. Um, Marilyn, thank you for what you have shared with us this evening and being so generous in answering questions and spending this evening with us. You have uh, been quoted as saying that churches make visible the sacred things in life. And I would nod to you and say, so does your literature make visible the things that are sacred in life. So thank you for thank illuminating you. those for us. Thank to you the audience much. members, well, thank you. To the audience members who've been with us, thank you for joining us for this evening. You can find Jack and, of course, all of Marilyn's books, fiction and nonfiction, 
wherever books are sold and in your libraries. And you can also read a recent interview with her in the current issue of Iowa Magazine. And we thank you for allowing us to do that as well, Marilyn. We have a wide range of virtual programming planned for this fall for our University of Iowa alumni and friends. And I hope you will join us for some of those future events. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you to our guests for being here this evening and have a wonderful night. You too, thank you very much.